Well, good morning. How is everybody today on day three so far of our World Congress? Today, our plenary session is going to focus on sustainability and decarbonizing transportation. All of you in this room know the statistics. Our sector is responsible for 15% of greenhouse gas emissions globally and 29% here in the United States. Yesterday, in a policy session with the, uh, representatives from the US DOT, the US Department of Energy, and the EPA, we were reminded that the clock is ticking and urgency of action is critical. While there's a lot of near-term focus, particularly in the United States, on electrification, which is a key first step, we know we need to be looking at a systems approach to reducing emissions and achieving decarbonization, but doing so in a way that's affordable and equitable. Technology is a key tool in advancing cleaner and a more sustainable system, and it will also provide more access and mobility for people no matter where they live. Today, we are so fortunate to have as our keynote speaker, Toks Omashakin, who was appointed Secretary of the California State Transportation Agency by Governor Gavin Newsom in February of this year. Previously, Tokes served as director of Caltrans, the California Department of Transportation. Tokes has been a leader nationally for promoting a safe, equitable, sustainable, and multimodal transportation system that builds on strong local partnerships. And California has been a leader in setting bold targets for emissions reductions that will drive action nationally. So with that, please help me welcome Tokes Omashakin. Morning. Morning, everybody. How's it going? Hopefully, uh, over the last uh, three or four days, you've had a chance to enjoy uh, California and Los Angeles specifically. Uh, get out and uh, meet people and enjoy some of, the, some of the good places to eat and some of the beautiful sights uh, in our state. I I'm pumped up this morning uh, to share with you a little bit of how from a high level in California, how we're embracing ITS and how it's going to play a role in how we move uh, people and goods moving forward. Um, I, there's always a lot of a, a excitement about this space, about ITS, because of the efficiencies we know will bring. But the thing that I'm really uh, paying a lot of attention to as well are obvious things like the sustainable environmental impacts and uh, the return on investment as well. That part, is often, that part is often forgotten. The fact that when we invest in ITS, we often get a, a greater or better return on investment uh, than sometimes the hard, heavy infrastructure that we invest in. So a little bit of a high-level overview. I'm not sure if I'll be able to get questions from everybody a little later. Well, uh, let me jump into it real quick. Um, so from California, uh, my new responsibility, for those of you uh, who, who don't know the responsibility, I've been in for seven months. My prior responsibility, I was the director of Caltrans, as was said in the intro. But new responsibility at CalSTA has oversight of eight different uh, entities. And the main responsibility I have uh, for the governor and the people of the state is to make sure that efforts between all these entities uh, is being coordinated uh, and is in alignment with the direction that the leadership, the governor of California wants to go in. So everything from high-speed rail, the Caltrans, to the Highway Patrol, uh, the, the Transportation Commission, all those things, make sure it's being coordinated in an alignment with the policy uh, views and the direction uh, that Governor Gavin Newsom wants to take the state. And that direction, uh, for the most part, falls under these, what I call the core four. I mentioned this when I spoke uh, here at the opening on Monday. These are in alignment with uh, the vision and the outlook that Governor Newsom has uh, for California. And he's, and he's four, and I'll talk about them just briefly before I dive in a little bit deeper. From a safety standpoint, uh, California currently has 10% of all fatalities in the United States on our transportation system. Last year, that number was roughly 4,258 people died on our transportation system in California, more than any other state. We're just a little bit north of, of Texas when it comes to that. And increasingly, the most vulnerable users of the system are being impacted. We're at a 16-year high 
right now when it comes to safety, uh, safety incidents, well, not safety incidents, uh, fatalities and serious injuries. From a climate action standpoint, 50% of the GHG in California comes from the transportation sector, more than any, any other sector uh, in our state. I think by now you know that nationally, the number for transportation is, uh, GHG is 20, um, and the international number is roughly 15 or 16% international. We're at 50. Um, and the governor likes to say all, this, all the time, if you don't believe in science, because some people are still arguing whether or not transportation and emissions play a critical role when it comes to climate change and climate action. If you don't believe the science, believe your eyes. Believe your eyes. The things that are happening around us right now today, from floods, severe uh, uh, temperatures, uh, severe storms, on and on and on, we can clearly see with our eyes the uh, connection to the transportation sector. Equity um, is uh, sort of the overall, the overarching theme for our entire state, for the entire state of California. The governor's team theme is a California uh, for all. And for us, that means every person, regardless of gender, regardless of race, regardless of economic status, has an opportunity uh, to, to succeed uh, in our state. And we know from a transportation standpoint, we've made poor decisions in the past. We've made poor decisions in transportation that have impacted people negatively, and we want to reverse that. We want to reverse that and provide uplift to people uh, across the state through the decisions we'll be making in transportation. And economic prosperity, the last of those four, is uh, essentially means that every person from the unhoused all the way to major corporations in our state have an opportunity as well uh, to succeed. So how does technology play a role in all these, uh, these sort of big picture goals, these, the core four in California? It falls as well under some of these um, sort of regulated goals that we have uh, for, our, for our state. Some of the goals that we have as well, zero traffic deaths and serious injuries by 2050 uh, on our system. Carbon neutral by the year 2045, we want to get there. Institutionalizing equity, uh, fifth largest economy in the world. How does technology tie into this and help us excel in these, um, help us excel in these areas? On that particular last point, uh, we're roughly at $3.5 trillion economy today, California. We're competing with Germany to take over the fourth, fourth spot. They're at $3.8 trillion, um, roughly. We believe we can get there. And what will play a role in getting us to number four, we believe, is the continued investments in technology uh, and innovation in California. So a little bit more detail on each one of these. From a safety standpoint, every state in the, in the country is required to put together an SHSP, uh, strategic, highway safety, strategic Highway Safety uh, Plan. Every four or five years, each state goes through a process of updating it. In California, we've narrowed down uh, to four things as our main priorities to be able to accomplish, uh, to be able to accomplish uh, the goals of our SHSP. And uh, if you notice, those four things that we've narrowed it down to, very much in alignment with the core four as well that I mentioned early on. From integrating equity into our decision making uh, as we uh, invest in, safer, in a safer system, implementing a safe system approach. I was the first state, we were the first state to, uh, when I was director of Caltrans, to put in place a policy aligning us with a safe system approach first state in the country, uh, doubling down on what works. That essentially means we know the tools that when we put them in place will make the system safer. We know what they are. For example, rumble strips or uh, median guardrails. Let's double down on those things that we know will make a difference and work. Um, that's the third one. And the fourth piece, very much again in alignment with the discussion we're all here for uh, in, in our SHSP is advanced uh, continuing to advance technology as a part of the solution, solutions that we're going to use to get the system to be safer. A couple of examples of using technology to advance that system. Wrong way driving crashes. We have a rash of them 
uh, in San Diego and in the Sacramento area. We've had a lot of wrong way crashes. Using pavement markings, like the ones that you see that reflect at night, but in the daytime, you don't even see them. That say, do not enter. You don't see it in the daytime. At nighttime, it reflects. If somebody's going the wrong way, they will repeatedly see those do not enter, uh, do not enter signs on the roadway. An intelligent truck attenuator. Uh, in California, our attenuator trucks get hit every other week in California, at least one time every other week. So imagine if an individual was in one of those. So we're trying to, we're piloting and testing an intelligent truck attenuator, again, to help make our workers who are working on the, our highway system to help make things safer for them. When it comes to climate action uh, on the core four, ZEVs have now become the number one, number one export. Uh, from California, nearly $5 billion, nearly $5 billion annually is the value of our exports uh, from ZEV. But here are our big picture goals when it comes to ZEVs and uh, making, uh, helping us get to a cleaner uh, and better climate. 1.5 uh, million vehicles sold by the year 2025. Today we're at 1.2 uh, million. We will surpass that goal. Uh, of 1.20, uh, 1.5 million. 250,000 uh, installed chargers, that one's gonna be a challenge. The infrastructure related to getting us to be uh, prepared for those devs, that will be a challenge, but I believe we can get there. By the year 2030, 5 million vehicles sold. Uh, 2035 uh, and on and on you see, and by the year 2045, 100%, 100% uh, fully electric, uh, heavy duty, and passenger uh, vehicles uh, in, in, the, in the state. This is gonna be a, a hurdle for us, a challenge for us, but we're leading the way. We're today 40% of the entire ZEV market for America, right here, uh, right here in California. But ZEVs will not create a utopia for our climate challenge. Um, let me be clear about that. They will be very helpful. It will be a big part of the change that we need when it comes to cleaner air and the environmental challenges we have in California, but it's not gonna be the only way. We're gonna to have to build and create a multimodal system, a more multimodal system, and use technology on the system to help us get there. Two examples that can quickly point to as it relates to this. Uh, I think many of people know how, um, how much of a role we play in goods and freight movement as well. When the supply chain challenge happened, more people became aware of how much of a role we play. The Port of Long Beach and the Port of LA uh, have 40% of the containerized goods that come into America, 40%. And the 710 corridor, the image on the right, is one of the uh, most heavily used truck routes in the entire country. It's often a bottleneck. We wanted to expand the 710 corridor, um, add a, a few lanes to it, but we've decided to dial that back and reimagine that corridor, the 710 corridor, and trying to figure out how technology and other tools can play a better role, a bigger role in helping to make that corridor more efficient for people and goods, uh, goods movement. Same thing, Harbor Drive, San Diego, uh, one of the busiest ports in the country as well because of the major naval base down there. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, cars get shipped into the country from Mexico through this port in San Diego. Same thing, how do, we use, uh, how do we use technology to improve harbor drive, freight prioritization systems, et cetera, stop allowing trucks to go through neighborhoods to get to their warehouses and destinations, make harbor drive, we're calling it harbor drive 2.0, make, uh, make it more efficient. When it comes to equity and technology, I mentioned this at, the opening, uh, at my opening uh, remarks uh, on Monday, Cal ITP is a, a tool that we are hoping will really, really take off in California and in turn have an impact across the country as well when it comes to transit. In California, there are more than 400, more than 400 transit agencies. You can imagine in the Bay Area, it's probably about 30 transit agencies. Imagine trying to get from system to system with different payment cards, with different payment tools. We're working company out of the Netherlands called Rebel, they're helping us implement uh, this too. We have four agencies in the state currently using it, but essentially what it is is a card that you can seamlessly use across the board. 
it will make it more affordable, more equitable uh, for people to be able to use uh, transit in California. Uh, there's a lot of detail that you can look up on this, but I'll, uh, I'll keep us uh, moving forward. Great tool that we're hoping, again, will take off in the state and across the country. When it comes to economic prosperity, again, from we currently in California have more unhoused people than any other state in the union. Uh, nearly 160,000 people, conservative estimates, are homeless or unhoused in California. How do we help people from that very level of life in California all the way up to, again, the big economic uh, engines? That's how we become more prosperous. The most, uh, uh, the, the wealthiest state in the country can also afford to be uh, the poorest state. Uh, with the number of people who are struggling in our state. So we want to reverse this. Uh, one of the ways that we're doing this from the other end, the high end, if you will, is we're opening uh, a new port. Uh, Otay Mesa East is a new port that we're opening in, in San Diego. When that port opens in two years, in 2024, it will have more ITS technology on it than any other facility uh, in the entire state. Currently, uh, our ports that, that are there uh, at the uh, San Diego region uh, uh, bordering Mexico, the wait times sometimes go from six to eight hours of wait times for trucks to get in from Mexico into the, into the United States, and sometimes even longer than that. By putting this, uh, this port in, it's nearly a $2 billion uh, uh, investment, and the impact as well will be in that range. By putting this port in, we're talking about cutting wait times uh, in half. Uh, and in some cases, much less, 20-minute wait times. Again, same thing, the, the, uh, the air quality impacts, the economic impacts for making uh, this, this investment, we will, we will uh, definitely yield the dividends uh, from it. And it goes without saying that we're also the, the major hub for uh, connected and autonomous vehicles and advanced mobility uh, in the country. Today, uh, there are nearly 60 companies in California, 60 companies testing uh, on our system. Uh, at least uh, 4 million miles, roughly, is what we've estimated. 4 million miles in 2021 uh, of testing happened. At least seven of those 60 companies, at least seven of them are testing fully autonomous uh, vehicles, passenger-less, uh, driver-less uh, vehicles in our state. So a lot of momentum in California as it relates to uh, this particular area. Uh, we've been hyping uh, CAV, connecting autonomous vehicles. We've been hyping it for many years. I believe it's, it's, it's truly uh, about to be at a place where we're gonna be able to get benefits from it. And I think what's pushing it, what's moving it even further along is what's happening in the ZEV space. Increasingly, all the ZEVs that we see on the system uh, have automated features, and it's pushing, it's pushing us further along as it relates to uh, CAV as well. So, uh, closing thoughts, I mentioned this, the core four that we have um, at CALSTA and its uh, agencies, uh, the departments under it, very much in alignment with the direction that Governor Newsom wants to go and the blueprint uh, that he set for uh, California. From an economic standpoint, lowering cost, rebuilding California with infrastructure, and the fact that uh, technology, uh, even broadband, will play a big role in that, making California healthier. The f when we build a more multimodal system that is cleaner, it will also mean that it's a healthier state, a safer California, and a, again, that commitment to climate uh, in our state uh, is so, so important. So in a quick nutshell, that is, um, how we will embrace uh, technology from California through our core four priorities. Um, and I think uh, technology with the return on investment, with the uh, environmental impacts that, that it will have, we will continue to embrace it and be a leader in ITS uh, moving forward in our state. Uh, I would love to be able to take uh, a couple of questions uh, real quick. I don't think there are mics out there. I don't think they were prepared for this. But I would love to be able to take any questions. I have two minutes to burn, and I, I know they don't want to hear that backstage. Uh, but anybody with any burning questions about California and our commitment to uh, the core four and ITS in general? Everybody's good? 
Everybody's bashful. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a real good question. He said, could I elaborate on Otay Mesa, that new port, uh, and its connection to, to equity? You know, because of how expensive uh, it is to live in our state, uh, there are a lot of people. There are approximately 1.8 million Californians, uh, not, not surprisingly, who actually live, uh, who live in Mexico uh, but work in California. And they're having to make that trip back and forth across the border. And that often means sitting at that border uh, for hours and hours on it. So it means emissions, but it also means a waste of time, uh, potentially, uh, uh, you know, as they look to, to, to get to work. So those people, it will make it more, from an equity standpoint, sometimes those people are middle to lower income uh, individuals or families who are living, uh, who are living in Mexico and trying to get to the United States to work. So this, that investment in the port is not only good for, for goods movement, for goods, it's gonna make a difference for uh, uh, Americans who live back in, uh, on both sides of the border trying to get across. So those low-income people, it makes it more efficient uh, for them and saves time for them to be able to get across as well. I, I think it's a very good question. I got 30 seconds. Somebody else? Yes, sir. I think I, think I understand what you said. Will, will the port also help get uh, goods onto rail? Is that what you said? That's a good question as well. Um, it's part of the vision. It's part of the outlook. What, just like most states in the union, uh, most of our freight, 90% of our freight moves on rubber wheels. Uh, but we know it's a cleaner way to go, uh, to go on rail. The efficiency of that is something that we're still, uh, still trying, to, trying to work on. We've got some challenges as it relates to rail over the last week. You heard some of those labor, I don't know if you're from the States, but you heard some of the labor, uh, labor related challenges that we have. But we know it's cleaner. We can continue to work on the efficiency part of using rail, uh, but it's clearly part of our goal. We know we have to get more from rubber wheels in our state to, uh, to rail. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just common sense. And that's how we did it for many years anyway, before untimed delivery sort of started to take off and we moved to highway. Anyway, thank you for that question. One last one, one last one. <laughs> yes, sir. Mm. Why we have homelessness? Uh, I think your, your question, just to be clear real quick, and I'll, I'll, I'll run, uh, is why do we have a high level of homelessness in California? Have there been any studies done with that? Look, there, there are multiple factors. It's just not one thing. Uh, obviously, the affordability uh, of living in our state. California has, uh, we're roughly three million units behind, three million units behind on building homes in California. Uh, so we don't have enough of a stock. So if you don't have enough of a stock, and it's also expensive, which means the demand is higher, you're gonna have that. And there's some parts of our state, like here in LA and the Bay Area, where uh, young graduates are making, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. And there are some people who are sort of more blue collar workers who are making forty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. And so when you've got that high level of disparity between people who are making, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 and they're young and the blue collar worker, you're gonna have a lot of issues like that. And that disparity in California uh, is significant. Uh, with the people who are making that kind of income. And, and, uh, and so uh, the fact that we don't have enough housing units, three million units short also plays a significant role in, in why we're going through that in our state. But we, the governor, by the way, just real quick, the governor is investing more in the unhoused than any other uh, state in the union and more than the United States government itself. More than United States. So we're up to $22 billion to try to reverse this issue. $22 billion. So governor's fully committed in making sure we can reverse, uh, reverse that challenge. But it's going to take time and partnership, local, NGO, to be able to get there. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I think the panel's coming up next. Please welcome to the stage.
Senior Vice President of Global Transportation Innovation at AECOM, Mr. Shaylin Back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's always great to hear uh, Tokes. Uh, he's uh, such an inspiring speaker. I will say, Tokes, I love that comment. Uh, you know, I've got 30 seconds left. It ain't a shot clock, man. You know? You know, you're not like trying to like get it right down. Please, everybody, have a seat. Um, I'll also say that uh, when Tokes was speaking, uh, it's always inspiring because, you know, I think there is an opportunity for us to use technology for good. And uh, on the climate side, it is so disheartening, though, when I hear Tokes say something like, we're, we're having a rash of wrong way fatalities on highways. Like, we have put people on the moon. We have developed vaccines. We can do interspace telescopes. And we still have cars going the wrong way on a highway and killing people. Like, it just, it is just so, such a clarion call for us to, uh, uh, to, to push and deploy technology as quickly as we can. So um, we have a fantastic global panel, and I think that's always a great uh, hallmark of the ITS World Congress, uh, depending on where we are in the world. So uh, to my right is Ms. Sue Wiblin, who's the Executive Director of Emerging Technologies for Transport for New South Wales in Australia. Uh, uh, thank <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to judge the audience by how much applause that they get versus I get here. Uh, in the middle, my, my former uh, home DOT director in Washington, D.C., Mr. Everett Lott, who is the director of the D.C. DOT Department of Transportation. Uh, immediately to his right is Ms. Margaret Anderson Kelleher, who is the director of Public City Works, City of Minneapolis, United States. However, she was also the MinDOT director uh, and brings like a really interesting perspective. And then um, finally on the uh, far end, uh, Mr. Gazim Okakoglu, the first counselor on mobility and transport delegation of the EU to the United States. So um, with that, we're just gonna go uh, down the panel and um, I think, uh, you know, there have been a couple of topics that Tokes raised, but just from your organization, how are you approaching the integration of transportation technology, such as ITS, um, into your commitments around climate and equity uh, and helping underserved uh, communities as, uh, as you uh, approach it? Yeah, so um, thank you. We're doing quite a lot in Australia, and I think certainly for us, if anyone's been watching the news and what's going on in Australia, we've had a number of um, bushfires floods, and floods, um, really uh, much more than we ever have. So we're really seeing the impacts of climate change in Australia in a really big way. So we are in most states in Australia, so our PTAs or transport authorities are statewide in Australia. So we find that most of the states have now targets for zero emission. Uh, and we have um, a real commitment to transitioning it, particularly our bus fleets, to electric. Uh, but we have vast uh, distances that we cover as well, so electrification is not going to be the only strategy for us. So we're exploring green hydrogen as well, certainly for our, for our regional areas um, and collectively as a, as a federal government to, to look at that. Um, we are the third highest admitter of, um, in sector in Australia for transport. So um, even if we look at our own fleets and uh, look at, at uh, electrification and green hydrogen strategies, it's still not enough. So we're installing large electric charging um, systems throughout the country as well so that people can um, be encouraged to convert to electric vehicles, so private vehicles. Uh, but also outside of that, in terms of the building resilience for, uh, for the organization, for the country, uh, we're also exploring a number of technologies, um, uh, satellite technology and imaging, uh, so that we can better re respond to flood emergencies and to bushfire emergencies. Uh, we're also looking um, at quantum computing as well. So um, we've sort of been an early adopter in the quantum space to also look at optimizations and how we better deal with the, the impacts of climate change. Yeah, the, um, I think that uh, globally right now, whether it's flooding in Pakistan, 
uh, yeah. you know, the fires in Australia, extreme heat in Europe uh, and drought in Europe. Uh, here in the United States, we have, uh, I mean, here in California, fires is a, a, a major issue, flooding. Um, so, it, you know, I think that, that future we were all very concerned about is now very rapidly approaching us. I, I will say uh, from an Australia perspective, um, it's great we were in Melbourne for the ITS World Congress, uh, seeing all the great innovation there, and then uh, the, the transport for New South Wales using the smart motorways, uh, that concept, something we actually uh, adopted in Colorado fantastic. when I was a DOT director there, so yeah, great stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, Everett, I just saw in the news, um, I think DC is uh, taking speed limits down now on major roads uh, down to 25 miles an hour, 40 kilometers an hour from a safety perspective. Obviously, safety is a huge concern. Um, so great, great stuff there. But uh, from, a, from an ITS perspective, technology perspective, how are you weaving that in uh, around uh, climate goals or helping to you know, deploy technology to help underserved communities? Well, great. Well, Shaylin, thanks for the question. And uh, I do want to bring greetings and welcome to uh, everyone from Washington, D.C., where we have the unique distinction of serving as a, of a local government, a county government, and also a state government. And so we have all those functions kind of wrapped up and combined into one. Um, what we're doing in, in Washington, D.C., we're doing a lot of great work and a lot of great things as it relates to ITS and, and climate. Um, one of the more important things we're doing is really trying to get people out of their single occupancy vehicles. So we've really invested very heavily into our, our car free lanes and our, our bus, um, protected bus, protected car free lanes for, um, for buses to be able to travel freely and efficiently. Um, what that is doing, and it's really encouraging people to get out of their cars and, and get into a very safe, reliable other mode of transportation, such as a bus. In addition to that, um, we have a lot of bicycle infrastructure that we've been putting into place um, and also shared mobility infrastructure. Um, we are trying to encourage individuals to look at other means and other alternatives um, as ways to travel, whether it's going to your place of worship, going to your school, uh, going shopping, or just going to visit a friend. We have invested about 3,000 additional capital bike share, which is the district's um, bike share program. And that program is a, is a DC regional based program. So it not only supports people in Washington, DC, but it's also in Maryland and Virginia. And so you can li literally get on a bike in Washington, DC, ride it into Virginia or ride into Maryland and leave it at that destination. It's very affordable and it's very efficient. And it's also, also very safe because we've uh, implemented over 104 miles of bike lanes, 24 of which are protected right now. And we have a mandate to do about 30 additional bike lanes over the next three years. So those are some things that we're doing. Um, it really has helped and improved um, how we're able to move around in the city. And ultimately, it is going to contribute towards our, uh, our climate goals. Yeah, I, I can remember living in Washington, D.C. in, like, say, 2010. And, you know, you had to, like, get a cab to get to a lot of places. And when I was living there uh, up until recently, you can get bike share, you can get a scooter, you can take the D6, which stopped right by our house. And it's become such a, uh, so much more of a livable city. And that's great uh, and, and really appreciate your work and the mayor's uh, leadership uh, uh, in this uh, space. Um, so Margaret, uh, I, was, uh, I was actually in uh, Minneapolis uh, earlier this year because um, ACOM has done a lot of work on the transit uh, facilities out there, and that's a city that you, when you think about cycling, I don't know that I always would think about uh, Minneapolis, but uh, it's a it's a cycling uh, uh, haven, lots of transit investment. So, from a technology perspective, in both with your state and your, uh, you know, now local experience, um, how are you guys uh, deploying technology to achieve those goals? Yeah, well, thank you so much, Shailen, and I'm going to show you a few pictures of Minneapolis and what we have going on, and I think to ground the conversation. Uh, and let's see if we can get that slide up there. We are governed by a family of plans in, in Minneapolis, and I would just say that to the point of both equity and climate, it's important to have a plan because uh, technology for technology's sake would not be really an equitable thing to deploy. It's really important that we have this. So we're governed by a transportation action plan. I actually have a QR code at the end for you with that, and that links to all the other plans. Climate action plan in Minneapolis, Vision Zero action plan, and our 20-year streets funding plan. So what does it look like on the ground? 
Well, on the ground, I don't want to go too fast here. Uh, this is uh, uh, intersection Washington Avenue, uh, and this is the the beginning of what the plan looks like in terms of, you know, the street crossings, our ADA ramps. We're doing a massive amount of work to make sure that we are compliant with the federal law, which we should have been compliant a long time ago. Also showing you just why technology is so important. We have a light rail line that runs right downtown and a lot of bus lanes that actually cross that light rail line. So signal prioritization, the ability to make this efficient and to work together. We don't run the transit system. Our metropolitan government runs the transit system, and uh, but we work very closely with them. And in fact, I want to just show you, you know, the guts of what it looks like. The guts of what it looks like is we are investing in larger uh, boxes right now to be able to accept future technologies. We're often doing double boxes. We are going through a modernization process with our boxes right now. We're very open to working with vendors on new products that go in the box for signalization. Uh, probably our next front to work on in terms of both equity, safety, uh, and getting more people out of their cars to wipe walk and bike are near to miss analysis. And that is because we know where we have crashes. We know our highest intersections with crashes. But what we don't know is what are we missing out there about this? I'm showing you right here the sort of collaboration that goes on to make signalization work in Minneapolis. Uh, Minneapolis traffic control, this is riding a metro transit bus. Uh, and being able to work to make sure this signalization works to give transit priority. Huge part of equity and climate is being able to move those buses faster. We are getting electric buses, but we still have a diesel fleet largely, and so being able to move those vehicles through and give that prioritization. This was working on a project when we were actually um, uh, doing some construction and being able to have that transit signal up there that you see that it, it was a busy intersection giving using the paint a very simple technique using the paint and the transit signalization to do this giving that advantage mobility um, I did a little trip out on the expo on the metro out to Santa Monica yesterday here I was really uh, inspired hearing Shalita talk and so I decided to take a little trip out and I really loved that on their mobility uh, signage they actually have the rules and so I'm going to bring that back because that's often a thing <laughs> the conflict between generations on uh, using micro mobility and older people not always loving that people are scooting near them or biking near them, but we have a very active large scooter program between Minneapolis and St. Paul, the University of Minnesota campus, and this is also showing you one of our micro mobility hubs that will show you how to get to transit and also um, uh, just showing that we are installing all over uh, bicycle signals as well. This bicycle signal will give you a solid green, it'll give you a solid red, and a flashing yellow if you should be aware as a bicyclist. Um, we have implemented an EV car share, and I think when you get to really working on climate and equity issues, we, we know the statistics. It is expensive to buy an electric vehicle. We have 120 of these EV car share cars within the city now. This means that you don't have to go out and buy the EV. You could maybe be a biker most of the time and need a car for a little bit of the time. Um, the important part of this <coughs> um, is to also say we have a goal to move three out of five trips out of a car, out of a single use car. This is an important part of that. Um, this is our new downtown Minneapolis. Hennepin Ave is one of the most important streets in downtown Minneapolis, running all the way through most of the city. Sorry, I should have brought the water out now. Excuse me. <laughs> <coughs> and what you can see here is actually um, the pedestrian sidewalk. But if you can see the gray on the sidewalk, that is a separated, totally separated and away from traffic bike uh, path trail. I use that to go to work. 
I come down Hennepin Avenue, I go down 4th Street where there's another one of these, I arrive at City Hall 15 minutes later from my home. It is amazing. And this is the future. The future is being able to give people the confidence to get out of their vehicle and be safe as a cyclist, to be safe as a walker, and uh, also safe riding the bus. This is going to be the next part of Hennepin Avenue where there's a $60 million investment uh, by the state of Minnesota in a BRT line. This is 1.4 miles of that BRT line. So it's a 14 mile line, runs from the suburb of, e suburb of Edina into the city to the University of Minnesota. What you can see here is we are narrowing the roadway. This is right now a two and two. We are going to a uh, two three with a turn lane in the middle for many important turns but we are also giving that protected bikeway, we are giving a protected walkway, and we are giving a dynamic lane all the way in this, this 1.4 miles is where the BRT bus lane would get hung up the most. So I'm gonna stop there. If you'd like to link to our transportation action plan, which is really the overarching uh, work that we're doing, and in that are the links to the other plans. I made a QR code. I have to say I was a little surprised the dinosaur was in the middle. Um, I think it's a warning if we don't change, if we don't make the change on climate and the change on equity, uh, we might go the way the dinosaurs went. So let's, uh, this is a, at least one example of how we're doing it in Minneapolis. So thanks so much. Well, thank you, uh, Margaret. Uh, I think the dinosaur may be the fossil fuel uh, <laughs> uh, piece there. And I think we've, you know, look at that, look at that service. That's a round of applause for the folks from backstage there. That's Good service, thank stuff. you. Yeah. Um, you know, when I, was, when I was listening to your presentation there, it was, uh, I love the transit, uh, the, the signal preemption. I was in Dubai earlier this year and they're, they're starting to do that because Dubai dealing with a lot of uh, traffic challenges and I think we'll be there for the World Congress uh, maybe uh, in two years time. Uh, and then uh, when you're putting the part about the boxes uh, and the oversized boxes, I think that's always a challenge for us with technology and I was, uh, loved what Utah uh, did with uh, all the dark fiber that they went out and, uh, and put out there in anticipation of it being needed, so I love the idea of, you know, just using those dollars now to sort of prepare for the future, so that's, uh, that's great. And then I love the, um, uh, the, the cycleway, and, and it's the transition to uh, uh, maybe the European side. We were in Copenhagen a couple of years ago for the World Congress there, and I remember walking outside my hotel, and, you know, we think about rush hour in the United States uh, with cars, and rush hour there, the capacity is with bikes. I think it's like 70% of the trips in Copenhagen uh, are, are on bicycle, and they're having to expand that infrastructure. And what struck me was that back in the 1940s and 50s, it was a car choke city, and they made intentional choices to invest in bicycles and, uh, and, uh, and other infrastructure. And so, you know, uh, Gizim, from a, from a European perspective, obviously sustainability is a very important issue. How are you guys balancing technology along with climate goals and underserved communities? Yeah, thank you, Shannon, for, for the question. And you, you're right to mention that uh, probably the geography and the density in Europe is, is slightly different to what we have here in the U United States, and that we really rely on uh, very dense cities. And where, when you think about it, the multimodal dimension is built in historically. There were metros uh, 100 years ago, uh, but also now we have indeed this trend going towards more active mobility. It changes a bit the overall pattern. And it goes in the right direction. Why? Because you alluded to, we live in a times of crisis. We had the COVID crisis not so long ago. It affected transport dramatically, aviation more than other modes of transport, but all modes of transport. We learned also from this time on how to build resiliency in our, in our network. But we have a very existential one that you mentioned, it's climate change. And uh, as in the US, we have uh, the climate uh, contribution, the G, uh, greenhouse gas emission contribution from transport is the highest of all sectors. In Europe, it's roughly 25%. And the bad news is that contrary to all the other sectors, the greenhouse gas emission from transport have continued increasing in the last year, with the exception of the years of COVID, where we see some positive elements there. 
but certainly there is no com complacency there. And clearly, as Europe, we were pushed actually by our citizens when they elected the previous uh, European Parliament and then when we had the previous or the current uh, commission in place to do something about this. And this is the European Green Deal where we also committed and put into law to become the, the first carbon neutral continent, if you want, by 2050. And, uh, and of course, California, we, we look also at California because there's a bit of competition there maybe uh, on, on when we can reach that. Uh, but also there, this 55% of reduction by 2030. 2030 is now, is very soon. And to do so, we will of course look at diversifying the, uh, uh, all the, the, the sources of uh, fuels. We want to get away from fossil fuels. And of course, with another crisis that we have right now in Europe, with uh, the war in Ukraine and situation with Russia there, it's another challenge. But at the same time, it is somehow comforting us in our vision that we need to accelerate this diversification and go towards renewable. And this hopefully will also help what we try to do in the transport sector. But just committing and hoping will not lead us there. That's why we also put in place, propose a number of specific regulations, uh, like on uh, limiting the, uh, uh, the, the carbon uh, greenhouse gas emission of vehicles by 2035 to, to zero, basically. And, and actually, California beat us there for uh, a few, a few uh, I guess, months, because it was just adopted a few weeks ago here uh, in California. But we are right now in Europe between legislators coming to that. And there will be other measures. Now the question, and coming back to ITS, how digitalization and ITS can also contribute to that. And there really our vision is, and has been in the past, but more, more, more than ever, that smart mobility is one of the enablers of all those trends that we are seeing. Smart mobility also in Europe means putting in place the infrastructure, best using the data, the information that is available, whether from cars, whether from public transport, uh, whether from what's happening also in other fields. You know, we, we, we see uh, the em emergence soon of, uh, I will call them flying taxis or uh, urban mobility, urban air mobility or advanced air mobility, new modes of transport coming into the picture and how to make best use of all that. This will be thanks to data, innovation, uh, technology, and one element on how to do that, you know, in Europe, at the European Commission, European Union, uh, once we get a mandate from our member states, from the parliament, to work on something, what we can do there is propose policies, legislation, but also funnel the funding and the money that we are there, that we have, in, into those projects. And that's what we are doing, and we are actually at, at this moment, specifically in the world of ITS, we are revising our framework for deployment of ITS, which is the, the ITS directive, to transform that into the framework for the deployment of cooperative ITS. Cooperative, not only with cars, cooperative meaning as a step towards a cooperative, connected, and automated mobility across all modes of transport. This is our vision, this is what we try to do humbly uh, to, to get to those goals. Yeah, you, uh, you raise a number of great points. On the cooperative part, uh, there's, a, there's a demonstration outside of a, of, a, of a vehicle that is detecting a bicycle, uh, which again, that's that idea of cooperation and also safety uh, coming together and then also helping to improve environmental goals. Uh, you mentioned COVID. I think uh, that has been such a, I think we learned that technology just in our lives and how we work uh, proved very critical in transitioning kind of our old world to the new normal, if we can call it normal. Um, and on the transportation side, now it's like, okay, how do we apply technology? Because now that same sort of like Monday morning rush hour peak has been redistributed. Now it's more focused on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? And traffic patterns are different in transit. So there's a lot of, uh, of, of opportunity there for discussion. But I, you know, when I, um, you know, you mentioned COVID and, and, and health, mm -hmm. right? Because I think before we used to talk about moving cars and trucks, and now we're looking at the, the health and safety aspects of things. And I remember being in Melbourne for the World Congress, and I, if I heard it once, I heard it 
a thousand times Melbourne, the, the most livable city in the world, right? And like over and over and over. And I was like, okay, no, we get it. We got it. Um, but I remember doing a tour and, and, and this lady gave us a tour saying, listen, we, we make a choice for signal preemption, right? Like the, the trolley goes first and then the bicyclists and then the pedestrian. And then if you, like you basically can't even make a left turn uh, down there, and it's, and it's this idea of if we want people to be more health, healthful in their commuting, we make choices that um, incentivize that. So from a, from, a, from a, you know, New South Wales or even, you know, other perspectives, how are you using your agency to, to promote this public health? Yeah, like I think there's, there's a number of things, and, and it's really pleasing that in, across all the, all the PTAs in Australia at the moment, we're seeing strategies that are being changed to be really directed between to place and community. Uh, and so as a transport agencies, obviously, we always consider place. But now place has become more, I guess, more focused in everyone's strategy around what we're doing and creating places for people. So in New South Wales, we're doing things like creating 30-minute uh, cities and 15-minute neighbourhoods. So that allows people to work closer um, and, and, to, and to live closer. But it also means that the uptake of active transport measures can also be more effective. So similar to everywhere in the world, we saw um, uptake in active modes during COVID. Uh, and so since COVID, we've invested heavily in new cycleways and infrastructure for cycling. Uh, we're a little behind Europe um, in, 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 it sounds like, some of the other places in, in the US. but. Um, certainly, um, electric bikes are also very, very popular. But um, so I think we're doing a lot around places, places for people. Even our interchanges, um, we're reimagining interchanges as sort of mo local mobility hubs uh, that are much more pleasant, particularly for people with accessibility issues or disability issues. Uh, we use virtual and augmented reality for people to be able to navigate places. Um, we're, as we talked about for decarbonisation to make the places you know, much, much healthier as well. So there's a range of small and big programs of work that are going on in Australia, but really with community and people at the heart uh, and, and rather than just thinking about transport nodes and transport corridors, but really thinking about community, community health, and, and certainly accessibility and equity is, is really key to every strategy you're seeing now in Australian transport. Yeah, definitely. Um, Everett, for, for Washington, D.C., obviously the, the speed limit reduction is, is, is pretty big. I, I also know that uh, you know, when, I was, when we were meeting, um, in, when I was with ITS America, you know, looking at some of the changes to like K Street and, and some of the others around prioritizing transit, you know, this idea of, of, of using transportation for health and using technology for public health, you know, how, how does that play out in your day-to-day your -day? Yeah, well, you know, we're, we're being very deliberate and very intentional when it comes to um, the infrastructure that we're putting in place um, as it contributes to, you know, health benefits, uh, also as it contributes to uh, improving the, the climate. So you mentioned K Street Transit Way, and Margaret, we're actually talking a little bit about that uh, in, the back, uh, in the backstage. Um, that is a major investment in infrastructure project, about $180 million, um, that's going straight through the downtown corridor of Washington, D.C., right along the financial district. Um, it's a major streetscape that will give us, again, another dedicated uh, car-free lane. Um, it will allow us to be able to put in infrastructure for protected bike lanes and also um, put in infrastructure that will support pedestrians who are walking and crossing um, the street much more safely. So we're really excited about that. That particular project actually, um, we'll actually break ground next year in 23, so I'm really excited about that. But in addition to that, you know, there's other things that we're doing in Washington, D.C. to help contribute towards uh, improve the climate and the economy. And so I had referenced a little bit earlier about um, all the infrastructure put in place. Um, but one of the things we're really trying to do is make sure that people understand that they have the options, um, whether it's the bus, whether it's the car. Um, they have the infrastructure we're putting in where we may have had traditionally um, more or, or not as many option, transit options in some neighborhoods. So we're going into those under-resourced communities, putting this in place, making sure they know they have these options, making sure they're safe and that they're affordable, and also that they're reliable. So we're really excited about what's happening in the district, and we feel like this is going to be the turning point. And the last thing I'll just add is that um, this time next week, I'll be heading out to the ne Netherlands. Um, they invited us, because of our infrastructure, um, bicycle infrastructure, to go in and, and look and evaluate their infrastructure 
by bike. So we'll be kind of biking all over the, uh, the country of <laughs> Netherlands um, and really kind of taking back some, some things that we can actually do and incorporate in Washington, D.C., and then also sharing some of our best practices with them as well. Yeah, I, I think that that is one of the great um, things that I've always experienced with the ITS World Congress is you get to go to different parts of the world and see, you know, what's going on. I think in, in the U.S. we got warm mix asphalt from, you know, from a European uh, uh, tour and there's just all these great ideas that are out there and uh, would, uh, would love to hear uh, what, you, uh, what you learn when you're there. Sure. Uh, Margaret, I, I want to maybe give you this next question from something you said earlier. You talked about the... Um, uh, uh, the generational challenge, right, of, you know, like folks maybe who are just used to a certain way of things and then that collision of uh, uh, baby boomers and Generation X and Generation Z. And, uh, and, and so how do you, you know, how do you, like, reconcile all of those different viewpoints? And, and it's not just those people, but then also, like, curb space becomes much more valuable in a city when you've got you know, uh, ride chair, and now we're moving into urban air mobility. So how do you sort of like start to bring together, you know, and this is great, you have a great background for this too. So uh, the, the wars between things like, uh, things you're very familiar with, parking, uh, parking spaces, uh, do we take some of those parking spaces and dedicate them to another use? Um, is there a way to share that better? And so that's one of the things on that Hennepin Avenue South, that 1.4 mile segment I showed you of the BRT route that became a really big flashpoint. And we had people who wanted a 24-7 dedicated busway, even though the system doesn't run 24-7. And we also had people who didn't want the busway really at all. They didn't want the bike lane at all. They, they, you know, they'll use sort of anecdotal evidence. I never see anyone biking here. Why is this important? And part of the answer is, right now I promise you, if you went down that 1.4 miles, you would want, not want to bike on the street either. Neither, I wouldn't want to. And so being able to make this change is, I think, really about finding those reasonable compromises. We're reconstructing this street for the next 60 years. We need to find a way to really navigate the next five to 10 years to be able to get through the sharing of the different uses. And so we're gonna do that with the dynamic bus lanes. We're keeping everything else. I think the other part of it that um, our mobility folks have worked on in my department is uh, finding some grant money to do ambassadorship. And so they are af actively working at the micro mobility hubs to help people get more comfortable in using micro mobility, especially people over, I hate to say this, 50, I'm over 50, but you know, it's, it, that, is, that is the case that you find that people uh, in the older generation are sort of wondering, well, what does it all mean? I mean, how would I in engage with this? I think that's where the EV car share is really important because it allows people to try something out near one of those micro-mobility hubs, have a good experience, and then also be able to maybe, uh, you know, use an electric bike for the first time. Our, our shared bike fleet is going more and more towards the electric side of things. I personally, during COVID, bought an electric bike. I love it. I think it's, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I don't... I, I don't need to be out there doing uh, a road race or something. I need to get to work. <laughs> and I need to get to work and not, you know, be sweat drenched or, you know, absolutely frozen. And so having that electric bike, I think, is another way that we help go over those barriers to get to that goal. Remember, the goal, when I go back to the plan, is to move three out of five trips in Minneapolis out of a single-use car into another mode. And so partnership with our transit agency is so important. We run the right-of-way, right? That's what the city controls. So we need to be able to utilize and uh, use that right-of-way that benefits that goal. And I'd say that's one of the biggest things. And part of it's communicating the plan. And Shailen, you and I have talked about this a lot. Um, when I was the commissioner in Minnesota and part of the ASHTO group, we talked a lot about communicating change 
for people. And I think at the heart of it, what is transportation about? Transportation is about people. It's about connecting people to the people they love, to work, to things they care about. And sometimes we can get really lost in the new, the shiny, the planning language, the but what we have to remember, this is about people. We have to speak to people and we have to come across these divides in a way that has us both decarbonizing the transportation sector and having, frankly, universal design, meaning that for equity, we design things that are going to be implemented to the people who need them the most, race, economic status, and it should work for everyone. But we're probably going to implement that first at the level that is going to be the most impactful for the most impacted community. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I think uh, you raised a couple of good points. I think, you know, building uh, a facility for 60 years, I, uh, I was just reflecting, you know, it takes in the United States about 12 years to deliver a major project. And if you were going to go deliver a major project when we were in Delaware in 2010, uh, it would be getting built this year, and in 2010, we didn't have ride sharing, we didn't have electric bikes, we didn't have uh, electric vehicles for the most part, and so how as you know, how do these stakeholders, you know, interface and build this infrastructure that's 60 years, it's going to last for 60 years or 100 years, on the technology that exists today that's going to get delivered in about 10 years? I think this is part of our conundrum uh, as a community, um, and just bridging those gaps. Um, Gizem, you know, from a, from a health perspective, I think that you touched on this, and, and I'd love for you to elaborate uh, on this, is this idea of using transportation, active transportation, to promote public health. Uh, so, you know, from your perspective, how is that, how can technology be a tool in, in driving that goal? Yeah, absolutely, I mentioned already, but certainly active mo mobility and promoting active mobility is something at the center of also what we do. Uh, we have drawn up a plan which is called the Sustainable Smart Mobility Strategy back two years ago where we have all those measures set out there in terms of um, greenhouse gas emission in transport, in, ser in terms of smart mobility. But certainly we also have one uh, central element there, it is our urban mobility framework because of the, you know, the, the way that Europe is constructed around cities and the importance of those. And there in this plan, we have specifically actions to continue promoting active mobility. The good news, if I may say so, or the good experiences that we have collectively gained also from COVID times, where at that time, because there was no traffic any longer, some mayor decided to have pop-up by and legs uh, for people to go around, contributing to the activity and also allowing them to move in times when there were restrictions. This has been, in certain cities, something which has stayed. And it brings me to this other notion. Can you also work on the demand? Can you curb mobility? More than 10 years ago, when I was talking to people about how the system will develop, there was this notion that curbing mobility is not an option because the demand in terms of mobility of people, transport of goods, will continue growing. But what we see emerging now post-COVID, and not only about bike lanes, is a number of cities building some restrictions to the uh, car pressure, if you want, uh, reducing the number of lanes and transforming those into bike lanes, or sometimes just abandoning one lane, and to see what is the effect on this. Interesting, I talk about Brussels, because I'm from Brussels, and uh, I was there in June before three years ago. In Brussels, they've done that in the last five or 10 years, not systematically, but punctually, they've reduced one lane in one of those main arteries getting from the suburbs into the towns. What has been the effect in terms of uh, congestion? You would expect, wow, fantastic, it will increase congestion. Effect has been none. It was still the same. The commuting time for those choosing to, to come by car was the same. They've done that again after COVID. Again, people tended to adapt. Maybe with the experience of COVID, they realized that there are alternatives. The point is that you have to bring the options, the alternatives, 
because this will have a comeback on health positive effect, and we are on that path. But also, I argue that when you talk about health, you have also to look at what I call the road safety general elements, because this is a health issue. This is a public health issue. We cannot afford to have 20,000 people in the European Union die on the roads, more than 200,000 severely injured, more than 800,000 uh, per year lightly injured. We cannot afford that. This is also a public health issue that we have to take care of. And that's where this change of vision from a mobility which become more multimodal, bringing together all those elements and where technology plays a role on showing what are the options, that is one of those visions. You know, very uh, popular term, mobility as a service. It's gaining ground, it's developing, it's articulating. We still need different pieces of the puzzle, but that should be the vision, of course, that, uh, that we would aim for, uh, that would also bring benefits in health, safety, etc. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, the, the, just the, we often talk about like sort of like public health and lose sight of the fact that with all of the fatalities, I, I remember being at uh, USDOT in 2009 and we were cautiously optimistic because we had gotten down to 30,000 fatalities a year on American roadways. Uh, and we were like, well, let's go towards zero. And just last year, I think uh, it's up to 42,915. And uh, I, I, I don't know, I just, I, we talk about it, and we talk about it ad nauseum. And so this, hopefully this idea that we can harness technology to finally, you know, start to get uh, that number down, because it's great that we improve air quality, it's great that we, you know, provide mobility, but if we don't stop killing people, right, I, I just, it just feels like it, uh, it, it, it's just high time. Hmm. Can, can I add, I think it's a really important point, the, ability to, de to demonstrate, when you ask about generational change, I think one of the other things that is uh, showing promise in Minneapolis is that right outside our city hall, so fourth and fourth, uh, a few years ago, the previous director uh, shepherded through the type of bike lane I showed you on the picture where it is actually up next to the pedestrian walkway and then at one of the corners it is narrowed, the throat is narrowed, so your walking distance is narrowed. On the opposite corner, uh, basically walking across uh, from fourth to fifth, it is not narrowed. So I'll tell you what one of my most effective tools is right now. When I'm talking to a policymaker and say to them, uh, you know, on your street, we're going to be doing a street reconstruction, we're going to be uh, narrowing the throat of the street, and they say, well, what does that mean, or what is it? I say, here's an experiment. Just go outside today. Walk across the street from 4th Street and where it's narrower and see how that feels versus walking the other direction across 4th Avenue. It is the number one thing I can do for people that shows them that psychologically uh, that is a very big difference. It is much safer. And what motivates that for me is, uh, in my bio, you might read this, I was elected at one time uh, to the legislature for 12 years. A longtime constituent a few years ago, after I was out of office, was walking in downtown Minneapolis. He had taken his car in to get his tires changed, an elderly man named Larry Gibson. Larry was killed when he was crossing an intersection where he had the right of way. Now, I think we all have someone like Larry Gibson in our life, in our work, that motivates what we do. That throating of the street, that ability to, you know, make that distance shorter, to use a better timing of the signal, to make that driver more aware that they are going to possibly encounter a pedestrian or a cyclist or someone on a scooter is very, very important here. And it's a real motivating factor. But I would say demonstrations, even if they're, you know, pop-up uh, dining during COVID, uh, as a commissioner of transportation, people, restauranters were like, please help us. Uh, and we did. And you know what we found? People loved it. 
And I think that that's where we can do some, some much shorter experiments and pilots to be able to help educate people and then fully implement after that. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, and if you look at some of the great cities around the world, they're the ones who are sort of reclaiming some space now <laughs> and saying, you know, it doesn't just have to be about vehicles. It's about moving people and moving, um, you know, and just creating this like sense of it's a place, as you were as you were mentioning. Uh, so we're we're coming down to the last ten minutes. So maybe for this last question, we'll uh, maybe just keep it to a couple of minutes each. But uh, you know, uh, there's always this challenge of getting the public sector and the private sector to work on the same scale, have the same motivation. You know, public sector loves a pilot, whereas private sector loves like let's get something that scales and and and, and, and can actually pencil. So how are you uh, in your respective places trying to bridge that gap? Yeah, I think for us, and COVID's a really good example of, um, of, of a lesson that I hope we've learned and we continue to, to learn that, that habit going forward. But um, we were able to do things at record pace um, at, in, during COVID. So, so things like using AI to detect uh, boardings on, on, on transport or um, people wearing masks and those sorts of things. So typically for us, um, getting privacy approval to use AI to do anything is, is particularly difficult. But, but there was a, a, a public need for this and there was government will and it, and it allowed us to create this really amazing shared vision between commercial and government sectors to just really get things done. And I think we're on the record in New South Wales of saying that we can't do things by ourselves. So, um, and, and even in, um, in the way we operate, we have an open data portal as well. So, you know, we, we, we put our, our data in a public portal to allow the corporate sector to, to commercialise it and to, to build products or apps or things that then can be used for communities. So I think in Australia there's a realisation that we kind of need each other if we're going to, if we're going to get the outcomes that we need. Um, and, you know, government's good, and, you know, I say this with a government hat on, but we're really good at talking about things and we're really good at have con convening lots of me meetings and sessions and those sorts of things. I think what we've seen over the last couple of years is the ability to turn those conversations and those engagements and collaborations into actions, uh, and, and hopefully we can keep that uh, going into the future. You can always have a good meeting. Uh, we love you know? a meeting. Love yes, a meeting, we love, love a memo, a meeting. love a policy. Yes, uh, indeed. <laughs> to get that big binder off the wall behind me. Indeed. But I believe the, the, the CEO uh, for Transport for New South Wales uh, comes from the private sector, indeed. came from airline industry. He does, and, and as I do. So, yeah. uh, you know, I've been in government now for a, a year and a bit, but there's a nice mix now and a nice tension, I think, um, in the agency of people who have and don't have government backgrounds. Yeah. That's always, it's always good to get that mix. Uh, Everett, you know, I, uh, I know there's a, always like everybody coming to you in uh, DC saying, wouldn't it be great if we could do this? And then you have to go back to your constituents and say, uh, let's see how we make this great. So how do you balance that public sector, private sector approach? Well, you know, we encountered just recently, um, got our first P3 off the ground. Um, and we talk about a major construction projects averaging about 12 years from when your you know, concept to implementation, it took us about eight years when we got started. And uh, we will go to construction next year as well in January, actually in a few months. But this is a P3, a public-private partnership that is allowing us to replace about 75,000 of our street lights and alley lights in Washington, DC. Um, this will allow us to be able to replace them with uh, LED, um, high energy LED lights. And you know, it gives us the capability of being able to control those remotely. Uh, also gives us capability of being able to see when an outage occurs and be able to respond much more quickly and much, uh, much faster. But the other thing that it does in terms of kind of like a health benefit, um, recognizing that in some neighborhoods and some of our under-resourced communities, um, there may be some challenges. And so it does allow us to be able to control the lighting in that sense where we might need to adjust it and increase it. Because we do know that when you kind of put a lot or spotlight something, it does help to uh, kind of eliminate and disperse. Uh, individuals and, and, and people that are gathering. So uh, we're really excited about that. This is the district's first P3 public-private partnership. Um, and the, the, the company that won the, the bid and is doing this with us, they're assuming 100% on the cost up front. So the district is not financing any of it. 
Um, there will be some back-end costs, of course, um, if they meet all the deliverables, but it's something I think is going to be a great benefit, a great win for the residents and visitors who come to Washington, D.C. Yeah, as you were saying that, I was just thinking of the remotely operating the lighting and stuff. I remember when I first started in transportation uh, in Kentucky, there was like people who would go out and drive the roads at night to see the lights that were out, right? Or we'd go out and get people to like count potholes or, you know, these things. And now with data uh, and with technology, we're able to just harness that. And it's great that you guys are getting that P3 going because that, you know, helps let the public sector take the risk and the private sector, right. you know, bring their, their capital. Uh, Margaret, from a public-private uh, perspective in uh, Minneapolis? So uh, first I'll say this is my first ITS, so I'm excited about this. This has been a great experience already. Uh, before I became the commissioner in Minnesota, I actually ran a technology association, a business association, for eight years. So in, you know, I find this a very... Um, natural place to be where we would be working together, where you know government is not going to be able to make those uh, cutting edge, bleeding edge investments where the private sector is, and then we need to be able to utilize them together. And I really think about how, you know, where are our next steps? I mentioned this already, the near miss analysis and intersections uh, using AI and other technologies will be important to us to deliver on our plan, our equity plan, and our Vision Zero plan. And, you know, that is not something that the city of Minneapolis is going to develop. So we need, we really need all of you. And then the other part of it I think about is procurement reform, actually. And Minneapolis is doing procurement reform right now to be able to allow department heads to more directly after going through a process uh, without having to go through council approval, which really slows everything down. And so I'm excited about this because I think it's going to allow us uh, up to certain dollar amounts to work more uh, quickly in deploying important technology for the benefit of people. And that's what I think is super exciting. Not always, not always the, the top line of things you see, but procurement reform is actually really important in being able to have successful public-private partners. Yeah, if you, if you can't get it to market, uh, then it doesn't work. And just, you know, hearing about the public sector and the bleeding edge, you know, I, I, I work with a lot of tech people, and they're always like, I was telling my people to fail and fail quickly. Um, and uh, in the public sector, you, know, you never like, oh, go out and really screw something up today so you can learn, right? Because then you end up in the newspaper, and that never works well. So, yeah. Uh, Gizem, just the, the public-private uh, partnerships and how, how you guys are exploring those? This, this has become the new normal for, for the European Commission as well. We used, to, we used to have a lot of research programs, funding for research, funding for deployments, and inherently in those programs, the idea was to bring people together from different companies, etc. Now, with all those challenges that we are facing, uh, whether in the climate change or on safety, we go one step beyond because we've seen the benefits of those uh, I would say the premises, all those uh, research programs, projects that have been going on. But we've seen also that some of those have turned into uh, early deployment phase. And the challenge is to bring those technologies, or ITS, to bring them, them into large-scale deployment. So just giving an example on road safety and cooperative systems. As a European Commission, on the one hand, we're supporting uh, companies to come together and do research. We're also pushing for a framework on the regulatory side to, to, to make this happen. But the success was when the member states or the road authorities, together with some of the OEMs, decided it was time to deploy uh, DSRC-based technology. And today, the success is that there are one million cars in Europe which are equipped with technology, 20,000 kilometers equipped with cooperative ITS systems, and to build on that, because now we want to go to most of it, we also have put in place a new partnership uh, called the uh, Cooperative uh, Connected and Automated uh, Partnership, because the next step is automation. What will it bring us? Uh, so we need all those people together uh, from the public and private. Uh, it's working. We do that in all sectors, by the way. We also have partnerships in the maritime sectors. Uh, historically, in aviation also, we have several of those. It is working to bring research in early deployment 
and then uh, more deployment. So we are on top of it. Yeah, you know, and, and I would say I love the fact that you, uh, you know, have that sort of optimistic tone uh, because I think that, uh, you know, sometimes we can get a little bit frustrated, right, uh, by, the, by the pace of change. But, you know, I would just say in, in closing for this panel, I think that, uh, you know, it is, a, it is a time of great hope and of great optimism that we can finally harness technology to make a difference in this, uh, in this climate uh, fight, uh, to make a difference for people who are underrepresented, uh, to, to make a difference in equity. And, you know, Margaret, when you were talking about the, the scooter, I remember seeing just last week in DC, you know, um, you know, a few people on a scooter, and, and, and I realized that they're not flouting the rules, like that's their family transportation, right? And, uh, you know, so we, we just need to be cognizant, because many of the people who make the decisions, uh, you know, don't have those sorts of challenges uh, and so we need to be very inclusive as we move forward. But uh, please thank me, uh, join me in thanking the panel for a great discussion this morning. to our panel for their great discussion. Um, and before everyone gets up, I want to uh, make sure that we give these industry awards out. Um, so it's my pleasure to present our industry award to Beep. Uh, many of you may have heard of Beep. You may have heard of them uh, because they were uh, are, uh, providing electric autonomous uh, shuttle service in Yellowstone National Park. It was the first national park to have this service. Um, but Beep also provides a community in Orlando, Florida with an alternative mobility network solving first and last mile transportation gaps with these low speed autonomous electric shuttles. Their network operates seven days a week with a fleet of eight shuttles and eliminates the equivalent of three to four private car trips. Their network connects more than 10 key destinations including medical centers, uh, academic institutions, and integrated on demand ride hailing capabilities. Their network in Lake Michigan served as a baseline for safely advancing the testing of automated shuttles and the expansion of BEEP-led tests and projects across the country for planned communities, public transportation agencies, and, as I mentioned, the first autonomous shuttle project in the U.S. national park setting. So with that, I would like to invite uh, Joe from BEEP up to the stage to receive the award. We'll go here. Hey, good morning. Uh, we had a, a bit of uh, confusion in that I was given 90 seconds to speak and I had prepared for 90 minutes. So bear with me, I'll speak quickly. Uh, but first and foremost, on behalf of our team, uh, we're certainly uh, humbled and very appreciative uh, for this recognition. When we formed Beep, Beep a few short years ago, and it was, it was really reassuring to hear the importance of so many of these topics among the panelists this morning but focused on how do we provide greater access to mobility, alternative means of transportation? How do we have a material impact on the environment and safety? You know, it's, uh, you hear in these staggering statistics of the fatalities in, uh, on our roadways in the United States, uh, 42,000 over uh, last year, 94% uh, of those being caused by human error impairment or distraction. Um, that is why these autonomous platforms are so key and why we need to advance the use of these to save lives, obviously eliminating uh, the most uh, impactful area of, of these fatalities is critical going forward. Um, I, I did want to comment on our partners uh, at Lake Nona uh, in, uh, in Orlando, Florida, and, and again, to reinforce some of the importance of the public-private partnerships. 
Uh, that project has been operating for over three years, uh, seven days a week, um, and moving tens of thousands of passengers and eliminating you know, many, many metric tons of carbon emissions, uh, and yes, impacting safety and how we move people around that 18 square mile community. Um, these efforts are not possible without public-private partnerships. The developer there, Tavistock Development Company, uh, has an eye on the future and wants to be part of this innovation. And they've taken the lead in really investing in this mobility network and, and uh, the impact that it's having in that particular community. But I'll also state that we've done this in partnership with NHTSA and their test programs with the Florida Department of Transportation, the City of Orlando, Orange County, uh, Lynx, our public transit operator, all of those organizations play such a key role in our success and in these projects, these initial test projects and programs. Um, the last thing I'd just like to comment on briefly is just recognizing several of the great organizations we've had a chance to work with over the last several years. Uh, those that get out on the front of this wave of transportation and mobility, we believe are going to be those leaders in the future as these platforms advance. Uh, certainly last year on this stage, the Jacksonville Transportation Authority was recognized for this Hall of Fame award, and their program there represents, we think, uh, globally the most advanced initiative in the deployment of these autonomous shuttles uh, anywhere in the world. Um, other partners, Mattamy Homes down in Port St. Lucie, Florida, uh, Peachtree Corners uh, in Georgia, doing some of the most advanced um, testing of, of connected infrastructure out there. Uh, the City of Orlando, the National Park Service, as was mentioned, uh, and so many other great visionaries that we have the opportunity to partner with. So again, thank you very much and a uh, pleasure to be here today. Hi, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm A.C. Yamamoto, the Secretary General of ITS Pacific. I'm very glad to announce the Hall of Fame Industry Award in Asia Pacific. The winner is uh, Lexus Australia. Congratulations. Lexus Australia has been pioneering automotive CITS research in Australia for the last four years. To improve safety, Lexus Australia undertook the trialing advanced vehicle communication of safety messages in Queensland Ipswich Connected Vehicle Pilot. In addition to VTV communication, VTI traffic signal information and important road network V2N updates were successfully demonstrated in conjunction with Queensland government's transport and main road. This activity informed participants of technology readiness and pathway to a wider implementation. Today, the name of the person who will receive this award, this ceremony, is Mr. Laos. Please. Uh, thank you. Thank you. The, look, uh, on, on behalf of uh, Lexus Australia, may I say that uh, firstly I'd like to thank the uh, ITS World Congress uh, Organisation Committee. Uh, they've done a great job today and it's uh, great to have everyone together again. Um, a special thanks likewise to uh, ITS uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, in particular to Yamamoto-san, I'm very pleased. Uh, I know Yamamoto-san, uh, and he's always been a big supporter of Australian operations. Uh, and of course, uh, to the ITS Australian 
um, uh, operations and, and the team. Uh, the, a big thank you to you uh, for your support and uh, commitment to road safety. Uh, importantly, uh, I think from Lexus Australia's perspective, we're quite humbled to receive this, uh, and this is a great acknowledgement uh, for the great passionate team that uh, is out there uh, that uh, is committed likewise to the cause of uh, road safety. And uh, I think as has been mentioned, uh, we'd also like to thank our partners. Uh, and this has been a great uh, project which has uh, incorporated, again, the concept of uh, government and industry uh, uniting with a common cause uh, to improve uh, road safety. And I think uh, to, to our teams uh, who are here, some of them are here today, uh, thank you for your passion to be able to do this, particularly with the difficulties that have occurred over the past two years. And I think um, that, again, uh, goes uh, to, to, the, to the great passion that they have. And uh, this has actually now inspired us more to ensure that uh, we continue our uh, cause with our partners uh, to, uh, to fight for that uh, zero fatalities from uh, road accidents. So thank you very much for the acknowledgement and uh, uh, again, uh, thank you. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, the third one in the row, last but not least, I have a surprise for you. On behalf of ITS Europe, where I'm the CEO, I'm very happy to announce you that a nice country in Europe will win with a nice company there, the award. Have you ever been in Vienna? Well, you should be. It's beautiful. It's Austria. The winner of our award is ASFINAC. ASFINAC is nominated for its vision 2030. Being a reliable, innovative, and sustainable mobility partner, they connect regions in Austria. They connect people in the real heart of Europe, with a heart and warm heart. The ASFINAC team is great, doing great developments in Europe. They were behind the European Commission's Sea Roads program on CITS. They have a landmark on that, and they develop quite some good services on connected and automated driving together with the Austrian and the European community. I'm very pleased to, to hand them over, and can I ask the representative Byrne from ASFINAC to come into the floor and give him a round of applause. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start with a question. Why would it be cool to work in infrastructure business? It's usually slow and comes with a huge legacy. Let me give you my personal answer. If you have a vision and a solid financial background, such as tolling, then you can create really ambitious and, and, and uh, amazing solutions that really make a difference for society. That's what keeps my team and me going and has been for 18 years now. I want to thank ITS Europe uh, and in special uh, Mr. Van Tommy. It really is a pleasure and it is an honor to be recognized uh, in, in such uh, a field of business for using digital technologies uh, to make traffic safer, more efficient and more uh, environmentally friendly. It is really a great pleasure. ITS is also a team sport, and so let me express my gratitude to Manfred Hara and our colleagues from ITS Services who do an outstanding job and have been doing this for years now. It is really a privilege to have you all on the team. Now, what's next for the future? We heard a lot about the, about the challenges today, and of course, we have similar challenges in Europe. What we think is we have to do is further improve our digital infrastructure to be able to integrate in uh, a mobility system that covers public transport but also connected and automated vehicles and we want to play our role there and uh, contribute to a safe and working uh, mobility system. 
We will do this by uh, employing, uh, of course, CITS, but also uh, other stuff like uh, sensor fusion, AI, edge computing, and a lot of te technologies that will help us to really blend into an integrated system. With that, let me thank you again and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>